Hey everybody, I appreciate everybody showing up. We've got a good crowd. Everybody who's joining us online or is watching this later, um, I want to thank you guys for joining us as well. Uh, this is a hot button topic that we're going to be discussing this morning, and it's one that's it's really important that we um, pray about. Um, so, the, the, as you guys are well aware, the title or the topic for this morning is uh, Fostering a Biblical Response to Gender and Sexuality. Uh, may, we called it Take Back the Bow, and it comes from Genesis chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. That speaks of the rainbow as a sign of the covenant promise of God to humanity. It reads like this. It says, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds of the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. So the rainbow then, the rainbow, why we call this take back the bow? The rainbow is a symbol of God's mercy, his grace, his judgment, and his love. But this, along with a lot of other symbols, uh, institutions, and even basic creation itself, things that have been given to us by the grace of God, things that are, are, are supposed to point us to this holy, um, loving, and wonderful creator, Things like marriage, things like um, gender and sexuality, even the cross itself, they've been perverted in a way. They've been perverted to bring glory to man and take it away from God. That glory is supposed to be reserved for God and God alone. He deserves it. And that honor of what is supposed to be holy and sacred, like marriage and sexuality, even the very word of God, it's been twisted. See, the Creator has been relegated in some way to something that can be used for human advantage in this way, to promote this perversion and self-indulgence. And see, it's time for the church to, to reclaim the sacred. It's time for the church to stand on the principles of faith and to stand on the very word of God itself. This is why this is a big, big issue. Because it's time for the church to recognize and remember the covenant promises of God and to understand the depth of love for his wonderful and beautiful creation. So today, we're gathering to pray to understand these concepts, to learn how the church has failed in addressing these things biblically, and to pray for a path forward with the strength and fortitude not to shrink in the face of the pressure to conform. I think all of us would understand that there's a great pressure for us to conform specifically on this issue today. See, prayer is so utterly important to this cause. That's why we're starting the, the discussion on this today with the prayer breakfast. And then tomorrow we'll talk more in depth in church. But let's start with how we got here. How did we get here? Well, to coin a phrase, it's a tale as old as time. The original sin of pride caused Satan to be cast from heaven. And when God created mankind in his image, he set us apart with special purpose and function. And that's, part of that special purpose and function was to give glory to God through a special relationship that we have with him. Satan, he used that same temptation of pride to cause Adam and Eve to, dis, to distrust God's original design. And unfortunately, that's what Many in the LGBTQIA2S plus community call us to do. They do that very thing. They distrust the goodness of God's creation, and instead of glorifying Him, they twist what God has given us, our sexuality, our two unique and complementary genders, to glorify themselves. That's really what's happening here. It's actually a form of idolatry. And it stands in stark opposition to the very first commandment. 
Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. See, the enemy's been drawing men and women into themselves ever since. And this is a very egregious form of this idolatry. Now, if you fast forward a few thousand years, we're seeing this play out in this grander, this more egregious way with a focus on the indoctrination of our children. This indoctrination is pressuring them and teaching them to normalize these behaviors. And yes, I very purposely said behaviors. Because it wasn't until Sigmund Freud in the early 1900s that the concepts of gender and sexuality actually began to change. See, it wasn't until then that the terms heterosexual and homosexual were actually coined. Now, the behavior was still there. But this is when those terms were first introduced. And Freud made the claim that sexual fulfillment was the foundation of human happiness. That is when sexuality began to morph from being understood and based upon an action to becoming what it is known today as an identity. And sinful man, in his idolatry of self, wants to control the narrative of what their identity is. As the postmodern movement uh, emerged in the UK and in the US in the middle of the 1900s, this, the idea of the grand narrative or of absolute truth began to become rejected. And that allowed for the establishment of concepts like relative morality. And these concepts allow for the human to claim whatever identity he or she wants in order to please themselves. That's an attempt for them to be happy, to find some kind of peace in life. Well, this identity has become the idol. So saying that the behavior is a sin is not just encouraging repentance of action. So see, we, we as Christians, we say, hey, look, this is a behavior that's sinful. Well, people say, no, you're, you're actually asking me to change something that is fundamentally inherent to me, my identity. See, that's where we got it wrong. That's why there's such a push for acceptance and celebration. See, the movement then says, this is what love looks like. Tolerance of what the individual says makes them happy. That's why it's not just about leaving them alone to live their lives the way they want to. There has to be a push to be accepted or else the individual feels marginalized. The problem is that these be, as these behaviors are normalized, that marginalization goes away and the individual now does not have the unique identity that they feel gives them value. Thus, the push for the next right that they have to have, or the next shocking display, or the next level of acceptance. And that will continue the more we, as the church, concede. The more we capitulate, the more we normalize the behavior, this actually just causes the pattern of behavior to worsen. This is why gender has become separated from biology in the collective hive mind of recent generations. This is why we see more and more letters being added to the acronym. It's a slippery slope, and we as a church have done a very bad job. And this is why I say the church has become homophobic. It's become transphobic, but not in the contemporary sense of the word. The ph a phobia is an egregious, unhealthy, or irrational fear. And that's what the church has of the LGBTQIA2S plus movement in our society. It's caused us to shrink in the wake of pressure to conform and to avoid the stigma of being labeled as hateful or canceled. The church isn't supposed to be these things. So people of the church see their loved ones who are, who are hurting and they see it as more loving to give in and to accept rather than to oppose their loved ones and cause more hurt. It's caused us to normalize. It's caused us to capitulate and even to embrace sinful ideas and practices as good and holy. And it's even caused us, the church, to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This issue has divided families, individuals, churches, and even denominations. And it shouldn't be that way. 
But fear, fear of this leads to compromise. And once the church gives into these sinful ideologies, we enter into a slippery slope of sorts. The reason is because the more we give, the more is going to be demanded of us. First, it'll be to, we'll be asked to compromise our principles and beliefs, altering how we even approach the subject. So we won't talk about it. Or we'll have to do it in the, in, in the guise of, you know, keeping communication open or something like that. Then as we give in, we are demanded to accept this lifestyle as normal and not the sin for what it is. Then as we're called, then we're going to be called to affirm the behavior is good. See, it started with this, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. And now it's, no, this is good and right and holy. And then finally we see where we're at now, which is the culture demands that we not only accept, we must celebrate this or face the consequences. If we are not an advocate, we're an enemy. That's the rhetoric. But this shouldn't be the reality. Why? Because the church... We're supposed to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, a representative of him to a fallen and sinful world, standing on the truth of Scripture. So simply, our response should be to take back the bow. We must reclaim what is sacred. And in this scenario, what is sacred is the beautiful expanse of God's love and his promise of mercy to those who seek him. We are called to make disciples, we are called to evangelize, and we are called to tell of the beauty of the love of God that has spared us from the wrath of a righteous and holy creator. But to do this, guys, to do this as a church, we cannot compromise. That is because of how sin has separated us from a holy and just God. We cannot, see, we cannot fully know the love of God if we tell people they are perfect just the way they are. Now that doesn't mean that we're unkind. But we must help people see this for the sin that it is. Because as I've often said, we cannot fully know the expanse of God's love if we have no concept of the depths of our sin. And if we tell people that what uh, what they're doing is not sinful, they will never know the true love of God that saved them from their sins. You see, if we're all just good people, there's no need for salvation and no need for God at all. But we're not good. So how do we as a church present this beautiful gospel? How do we show people that their identity and worth is so much greater if it comes from a perfect, holy, and loving God, a God who indeed designed us all in his image and loves us enough to die for our sins? How do we do that? How do we get people to see that? Identity is being so much greater. Well, as a church, we cannot be afraid. In order to do this, we cannot be afraid. Now, the Bible says a lot about fear. The Bible actually says a lot about fear, but there's one particular passage that sticks out in my mind, and it comes from Psalm chapter 12. It reads like this. It says, You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. Isn't that precisely what we're seeing today? What is vile is being honored. But see, in this passage, David, the psalmist, he recognizes that God is sovereign. He is omnipotent and powerful, and he loves his people. He also, and, and guys, he loves his people, but I have to stress this. God also loves those who are in the LGBTQIA2S plus community. He loves them. And because he loves them, he desires what he desires for us— that they will come to repentance. Second Peter tells us that. And as God calls all men to repentance, so must we as the church call people to repentance. This is, in fact, the most loving thing that we can do for individuals. 
to help them see the depths of their sin and the enormity of God's grace. This is why we cannot be afraid of standing on the reality and truth of Scripture. This is huge. We as a church must not capitulate to the lie, because when we do, we do more damage than good. If we concede to use preferred names, preferred pronouns, and the like, we are actually driving people more into themselves and thus further away from God. The problem with many in the church today is that we see, we kind of use this as a comprom- compromise in a, in a kind of a bait and switch type of way. So you'll hear people say that, hey, they're keeping up lines of communication with the individual so they can present the gospel later. But all we're doing at that moment in time is lying to the individual. No. We, as a church, must be able to stand on the absolute truth of Scripture. To be kind and respectful, but never, ever, ever concede. Never, ever, ever concede. For Scripture tells us that we are called not to lie to one another. To to paraphrase a former transgender individual named Lori Perry Smaltz, who actually spoke at this church a few years ago, from my understanding, this, this woman lived a life as a man for nine years. And, when the indi- and, and to kind of paraphrase what she said, it says, when the individual comes seeking answer for why the continuous morphing and changing of identity has not brought the contentment in, that they're looking for and why the idolatry of self has failed to bring the satisfaction and happiness that they're looking for long term, and they start to believe, they, they want to stop believing the lies, they are not going to return to the people who lied to them. They will go to those who have stood on the truth in a loving way. That's what we as a church have to do. Now, I'm going to tell you from personal experience, actually, that as you stand firm on this gospel, as you stand firm on biblical truth, you will likely be called a hater. You will be canceled, blocked, shut out, and disowned by people you love. You'll be canceled by the culture and by people who see the gospel as offensive, hateful, and hurtful. And I'll I'll tell you, such ostracization can be hurtful in return. But I want to encourage you again not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to fear those who can hurt you, but to remain steadfast, knowing that our labor, especially on this issue, is not in vain. As stated before, the rainbow. The rainbow is a symbol of the covenant promise of God. A, the new covenant of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the love of a perfect holy God that these individuals need to hear. It's one that we all need to hear over and over and over again. Prayer. Why we're here today. Prayer is so vital to reclaiming our understanding of the sacred. It is so vital to our ability to fulfill our great commission calling. And it is so vital to those who are hurting and struggling and who need to see their value and worth as it comes from God and not themselves. And that is why we're here today. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me. God, this morning, we pray for the church. We pray for your Holy Spirit to rain down, to convict our hearts of the truth of your word, and to give us strength and fortitude to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your covenant, we thank you for your promise, and we thank you for Jesus, whose blood has saved us from eternal damnation, and in whose promise we have hope. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen. Now what I'm going to encourage you to do is grab some more food, grab another cup of coffee, take some time at your tables to pray specifically for individuals who are being deceived. You probably know folks. Um... And for the church, pray for the church to be able to respond in a truly loving way as we embark to take back the bow. Before I do take my leave and grab some food myself, I want to invite everybody back tomorrow morning for church. Um, We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, okay? So I just kind of hit the surface this morning. And we're going to talk about a little bit more detail about how the church should respond and how we got here. And the service also will be live streamed for those of you who are joining us. It will be live streamed starting at 11 
uh, a.m. And I also want to say that um, our next prayer breakfast (laughs) will be June 24th, and the title of that will be The Reliability and Relevance of the Bible to Modern Culture. So uh, join us for that one, but that's down down the road a little bit. Um, And uh, just remember, so come back tomorrow for a little bit more information uh, on this uh, uh, for church. We also will be having lunch after church as well. We want to invite everybody to do for the potluck. And then um, I'll be around uh, if anybody has any questions or concerns. I want to thank everybody who's been joining us online or is watching this later. And um, join with me and let's take back the bow. God bless everybody.